Hello, and welcome to our behind the scenes look at the Underground Railroad, the visually stunning and emotionally devastating Amazon miniseries from creator Barry Jenkins, and based on the Pulitzer Prize winning novel by Colson Whitehead. I'm Ebony Adams, Manager of Public Programs for Women in Film. Today's conversation is part of our 2021 WIF TV Summit and is hosted in partnership with Amazon Studios Prime Video. It's our privilege to bring you roundtable discussions like this one, in which talented creatives can gather to share fascinating insights about the magic and craft behind the tremendous world building of shows like the Underground Railroad. So joining me to discuss the show are costume designer, Caroline Eslin, who also worked on If Beale Street Could Talk and Moonlight, as well as Troop Zero, Oscar nominated editor, Joan McMillan, who's also a longtime Barry Jenkins collaborator, who's worked on Moonlight, If Beale Street Could Talk, as well as films like Zola, set decorator, Lisa Scopa, known for her work on Orange is the New Black, Billions and the Deuce, and visual effects supervisor Dottie Starling, who's worked on everything from Titanic to Twilight Saga to Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Hello. Thank you. I am really excited for this. So as part of our um, WIF TV Summit, you know, we've hosted many panels in which we talk to folks from various different projects at once. And it's been fantastic to get, you know, the perspectives sort of across the industry as we talk cross genre, you know, cross format with these people. But I really, really love these panels in which we can, you know, have a singular focus and really dig in to a specific project. So um, I want to start with kind of where it starts. When you've taken the job, before, you know, uh, filming starts at all, I want to know what sort of like prep and research you're doing for a show like Underground Railroad, right? So what sort of research on some past work that you've done? What kind of conversations are you having with the other members of the creative team, you know, to help you prepare to deliver the look and, and the feel of, you know, this kind of show? And Carolyn, why don't I start with you? Well, you know, with the Underground Railroad, a project of this scope, your the research was deep and far and wide. Mm -hmm. I started probably a year before we even started started prep. Just mm -hmm. um, I went to um, I went to the New York Historical Society. I went to the Schoenberg Center. I went to um, the Whitney Plantation in Louisiana. I um, went to various other libraries. The research process, it was, it was probably the deepest and, and widest I'd ever done on a project. And, and you kind of n never can do enough. It was, it was, you know, we, we were in s multiple periods in the show. And so in sleuthing out what Colson Whitehead did in the book, um, so there was many layers of what we needed to find and how we were going to create the show and what we were going to sort of convey. And I think the biggest, you know, the, my biggest challenge in the beginning, as I've said before, was figuring out what periods we would be in for costume. Um, and the research process went all the way, you know, all the way through, but it was, um, and it was batted back and forth between Mark Friedberg and Lisa and Donnie and, um, you know, just all sharing information, sharing lookbooks, sharing character research, sharing, you know, things. And Matt Marks, our prop master, just sort of, you know, we would all share what we had found or what we had sleuthed out. Um, it was a very, um, very wide uh, and deep research period, probably the biggest um, I've done. Uh, so, and it came from many, many, many places. Were there things that you found in your research that you found, you know, like so compelling, you know, so interesting that you thought, yes, this, this absolutely, I want to, I want to replicate this. I want to bring this to the screen. Because we were in multiple periods, I, we took it episode by episode. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, looking at all the, we found every, I, we, I think I think we found every published image of an enslaved person, um, and I, you know, would find descriptions of clothing, and you know, through also the slave narratives and slave bulletins. Um, I think you know, from episode to episode, it 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 changed. It was you know finding the authenticity of for you know for Georgia and looking at you know a million different you know paintings and art and and daguerreotypes um, 
1880s for South Carolina in looking at um, these incredible images of the, it was a portrait, there were, um, there were some beautiful portraits we found of black women that were in a studio setting um, mm -hmm. that were very inspirational to us for South Carolina um, in these beautiful, um, beautiful dresses and beautiful silhouettes from the 1880s that I absolutely drew from for the costumes for, for the South Carolina episode and, and, and some beautiful pictures of, of, um, of men in that period as well um and of black men specifically too it wasn't you know i found lots of and it was really wonderful to find um you know black people in these beautiful settings in in 1880s and um and you know and i think that has historical significance it's after the war it's you know after reconstruction um so then for 1830s finding yeah I could go on and on by episode by episode but it was very specific for every episode once we figured out where what periods we were going to be in mm -hmm. um, and some periods were given to us as far as timeline of story wise like we knew we were 1850s but then like when we were in the great spirit we knew that was Ridgeway's origin story so we knew, we knew that like our story started in 1820 1850 we needed we needed the great spirit to be in 1824. So that was period was given to us. We had to sort of make, we had to, we looked at a, a Colson Whitehead had, had referenced um, incidents of a slave girl in Harriet Jacobs life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how we figured out 1830s for North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, and we found this like very huge, the 18, mid 1830s was like a very weird time for women, for ladies fashion. It was also a very like kind of grotesque, weird, big sleeve. And we knew that we really wanted to do that to make it more even sort of, sort of wicked and terrible in North Carolina. So anyway, to make a long story short, we went from, you know, every, every episode was completely, you know, researched by what we needed and finding what we needed it to be. And what, you know, with, uh, jumping for Indiana, you know, we found, you know, learned all about these amazing black utopian societies. That, mm -hmm. And we, you know, um, found photographs and other, um, you know, photos of those towns and those places and, and drew and drew from that too. So it really was just vast of yeah. what, we, what we drew from and, and found. But um, yeah, I was grateful for, to find those sort of key things that informed what we needed to do, what we needed to do. Right. Lisa, I'd love to hear from you. I imagine that, you know, your, your experience was similar, you know, and that there was, you know, lots of research involved. Um, but I, I would love to hear, you know, from your perspective, you know, what the, the research that you were engaged in, you know, um, what it, how it then showed up on screen, you know, how you took what you were learning to then execute the, the aesthetic like you were looking for. Well, I, I came on to the, the project um, a, a little bit later because um, I took over for um, my, my really good friend who I've worked for for a long time, Deborah Shute, who had to leave for health reasons. And we were um, only, I think, seven or eight weeks out. So I, I, I didn't have a lot of time. Uh, I was very, very jealous throughout of everyone else who had had so much time to really delve into the uh, research. But um, and I, I just kind of came in and just hit the ground running um, and sort of learned as I went along, but there was such a wealth of, of information at my disposal. So it was, you know, it was, it was easy because everything was already there, you know, for me to look at. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, again, we, we, we looked at everything available to us that described uh, the settings, um, just like Caroline did before the clothing. And we learned about all sorts of things. We learned how to make indigo, um, how, you know, a kitchen in the slave quarters would be set up, how, uh, you know, how people entertain themselves and what they, would they have, how would they um, express their creativity, um, all, you know, so we really, um, you know, or what they grew in, in the gardens, like what kind of seeds were specific to that time. I remember one of my favorite things of that show was a meeting that we had about, you know, garden seeds with, you know, we sat, we sat with Barry and uh, our greens person and we learned all about, you know, every single seed that 
would have been um, and every single plant that would have been appropriate for the time period. We also learned about how um, much Barry hates okra. <laughs> 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 um, but anyway, so we, you know, we really uh, knew as much as we could. And then, you know, one of the great things about what we do is that once you really, really know, you can also depart from it a little bit and sort of force reality a little bit so that you um, are able to um, tell the story better, you know, and so you, you adapt and you adjust and you um, create uh, some, something from it, from what you've learned. And I think that that's, that's my favorite part of the job. And on, in this case, you know, we were especially respectful of the, of the history and of the story, but um, still, uh, you know, in part, uh, thankfully, like the, the, the story itself, you know, the element of magical realism allowed us to um, really take some um, take some uh, liberties in, as far as the sets um, went, but also um, you you just tend to take away or add according to how you want the story to be told visually. So that was, you know, that's always the best part of uh, my job, I think, you know, sort of modifying so that you can tell your story better. Right, right. Um, Joy, so we had the privilege of talking to you a couple of times during the summit, and every time you have something new and interesting to say. Um, I would love to hear from you about your prep um, for the show, knowing that it isn't going to be a straightforward linear narrative, you know, that it's more than just a sort of standard period drama. It's like nothing that we've seen before. You're working with, again, you know, longtime collaborator Barry Jenkins. So I assume you've developed a kind of shorthand with him over the years, but I would love to know, like, how do you prepare for a project like this one that is so singular? Yeah, you know, with this one, I definitely, you know, read the book and knew how unique Colson Whitehead's voice is, you know, as an author, he has so much layered and his characters are so fully formed. And so with me, one of the things that I wanted to be mindful of is in the novel, you're always constantly in step with Cora. Even though you meet these other characters, you're introduced to you know these other people who have just as interesting story as Cora, but she's our focal point. And so that's one of the things that we are very cognizant of throughout the series is that no matter where we were or no matter what chapter we were in, we were always connected to Cora in some way. And I think, you know, taking a step back and looking at the series as 10 episodes is a bit overwhelming. And so one of the things that, you know, we really focused on was each episode scene by scene and making sure that we're aware that yes, it's a, an epic story that we're telling, um, but you know, the devil's in the details. And if you're nuanced and you're detail oriented and you're telling a story in a very precise way, I think the audience will get on board with you and will be invested um, in you know, this main character, Cora. Question for Carolyn. I wanted to ask you while you were talking, where did that orange dress for Mabel come from? Because that's like one of my favorite pieces. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's so stunning on Sheila who plays um, Mabel. It's like, I told Barry in the edit, I'm like, that is, there's a moment where she walks into Polly's cabin and it's just so stunning. And I was like, that's like one of my favorite pieces that Caroline did, yeah. It came from Western costume. It was, we built Mabel's, you know, eggs, her escape dress, but we needed just, and we had three other dresses like her sew and play and Barry, you know, of course was like, no, 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 no. And it was just <laughs> like, no more dresses. Like it really always was. Uh, he just had, we had that one. And then I think she only wears one other one, but that one yeah. from Western, Western costume. And I, uh, you know, we sure did put a lot of dirt on it. <laughs> and, and like it was, it was, you know, when we age the pieces that are come from, you know, Western costume and, and put it on, you're like, oh, I hope that that dirt comes out later. But it looks good. I love you, Western costume. Thank you. <laughs> Shout out, Western costume. <laughs> Dottie, I want to ask you about your prep work for the show. So I've been reading some interviews with you. Um, and one of the things that I found so interesting is um, your discussion of various visual influences um, for the show. And in one particular, you mentioned Chernobyl. 
which yeah. I found fascinating. So, you know, what is your process as you're sort of gathering, you know, this wealth of, um, of professional experience that you've gathered, you know, over all of your work? You come to a project like this one. How do you start to work with the creative team to say, this is what we're going to do? And um, we're going to execute it. Yeah, I mean, the way I start is I need to see the world where Barry sees the world. Mm -hmm. I need to sort of figure out how he sees things, how he frames things, um, what he does. I start by, of course, reading the book and sort of sort of how those visual things happen. But it's very much I looked up sort of how James interviews with James, sort of how he talks about framing things, how he talks about lensing, camera, light, um, sort of how he talks about digital versus film film because that sort of gives me a color and sort of a scope of things. And sort of Barry as well, sort of starting off with knowing he's about portraiture and sort of where does that portraiture come from or what in my past sort of, I looked at Vermeer a lot as well. Um, but it's, it's sort of my job a lot is not, it's sort of telling the story they see and I have to figure out how they see the world. And sort of that's where I start from. And sort of James's lookbook helped a lot but we would talk a lot about, I would ask Barry questions because we would talk about how things might transcend from one episode to another, how we might bring things in. And then I start looking for references as well and sort of put them out there, sort of things that give, and the Chernobyl came up because just of the sort of softness of it. There was something that was so eerie and so it took you, it was beautiful, but it took you into a space that was pretty much really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And so, there was something when we talked about, it, we talked about it with the train coming. And there was something that this thing is there, but is it really there? Is it, you know, and there's, when she sees it, is there something very magical and soft and beautiful about it? But then when we look and it's a train's POV and we want that train to be there, it becomes something very rigid body. It's very real. The tunnel is breaking apart. There's rocks falling and things like that. So, I mean, I very much start though, I need to see how James and Barry see the world. I need to see what they do, how they shoot things, how they talk about lensing, how they talk about cameras, because that's going to tell their story. Mm -hmm. And my number one job is not to sort of tell or to do how I see it, but to figure out how to see what they see and sort of give them those images back. That's, that's such a wonderful um, lead in to my next question, which is, one of the great things about conversations like this one is that we get to talk to people from various fields, right? And so I would love to hear from all of you, like, who are your key collaborators outside of your department? Who are the, you know, departments, the people that make it possible for you to do, um, you know, what you do? Well, I'd say James Laxton. <laughs> <laughs> I would say Cameron. <laughs> Okay. Um, our cinematographer here is definitely a key collaborator. And of course, you know, Mark Friedberg, who amazing production design, and um, Annalie Blank, who um, is our sound supervisor and re recording mixer. Um, mm -hmm. Those three, I think, are key in my collaboration <laughs> process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dottie, you were saying something? Yeah, I would say it'd be James and his camera team. It would be, of course, Mark Freeberg and all the art department team. Because mm -hmm. they, they sort of give us our looks for everything and sort of point us in the right direction. But I mean, if I'm on set, it's grip and electric. Those guys <laughs> save my butt every day of the week. <laughs> and if you talk really nice to me, you get what you want, too. <laughs> Lisa, what about you? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I of course, I... Uh, the designer is the person that I work most closely. He's the person that establishes the aesthetic. So, and and then also for me, it's the DP and the gaffer. A lot of the time, I do you know I provide a lot of the practical lighting, or you know, so I have to uh, talk about how to you know give lights that look good on a set, but also provide you know uh, lighting for the that that's okay for the DP and the gaffer. And then, you know, the prop master, of course, I work with very closely. He's, there's stuff that he has that has to be very specific to the script or to what the director wants and then has to fit in a set. So yeah, those are, yeah, that's pretty much the people I work with. Mm -hmm. Caroline, what about you? Yeah. And Pastor Nick? I, I also forgot Nick Patel. I'm so sorry, of course. It's okay, <laughs> 
We don't want to just probably like, well, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> but of course, of course, Nick Bertel. <laughs> Your phone's gonna be blown up after this. I didn't know my name. I wish I could have more collaboration with Nick Bertel. Yeah, and, he's so yeah, lovely. He's yeah, so wonderful. I collaborate with everybody on this screen. I mean, I was thinking about it before, like Dottie, you and I have to talk about, I was thinking about some things that we really had to make sure that we were coordinated with. Um, I talked to Dottie, Lisa and I, you know, share colors and, and walls and curtains and beds and fabrics of dresses and, you know, sort of go back and forth. We're constantly, you know, share talking collaborating there my other click key collaborators you know, for sure donnie um mm -hmm. donnie and i will talk about character and depth and what you know sort of happens up up here and like i think well donnie and i have a lot of talk about on on underground railroad a lot of talk about facial hair and how facial hair works with the costume um i should have said donnie as well we did a lot on the show together yeah, yeah. Um, but also, you know, of course, Mark Friedberg, I, I feel like I collaborate with, you know, so many, so many people are, you know, we, we need to be, we need to be with on, on set. It's bigger than, you know, if you start counting the people that it's definitely close, closely Mark and, and Donnie and Lawrence and, um, Lawrence, our head, of, you know, our hair department head. And, um, and I talk to a lot of people. Definitely to make sure we're all in the in the right place or I'm in the right place. Yeah, I think also, I mean, you guys tell me if I'm wrong, but I think on a show like this with the scope and the depth of it is it took very much a team to do it. It was we all were constantly asking each other questions, yeah. going through things, bouncing things back and forth. And sort of you have to run things by everybody because you can only you got to shoot it in a way that gets it shot and you have to do it in the most efficient way. And it takes a team to do that to figure it out. Yes. And Barry always wants it to look real. So yes. <laughs> it makes all of our jobs even harder. <laughs> and then look what we, the audience, did. You yeah. know, the backs of the ulcers y'all are getting, you know. <laughs> and we appreciate it. Oh, so one of the reasons why I asked about your key collaborators is because, you know, this is a, um, you know, a, an event in which many women in film members will be watching. And a lot of them will be emerging filmmakers themselves. And so, you know, we wanna encourage this understanding of the nature of collaboration um, among, you know, groups, um, you know, resisting the idea that departments are siloed and that people are making choices independently. That's not how it happens. You will be developing and maintaining relationships and you better get good at it because otherwise the work is gonna suffer. Um, Definitely. So along those lines, I'd love to hear from you all, like, what is the biggest misconception about your field from people outside of the industry? <laughs> so many. <laughs> yeah, so many. <laughs> that is <it's> easy. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. So, that is glamorous. Yeah. <laughs> my job is just blue screens and green screens. Yeah. I remember that's funny that you say that Dottie because I remember I had a PA and I was working on a film and we were trying to pick what was going to go into the computer screen and he was like whoa so you put stuff into the computer screen <laughs> and like I think his mind was blown and he realized how much an image is oftentimes manipulated mm -hmm. um, or how many how many people are working to create this very specific image from art department to VFX to costumes like there's it's just such so many layers yeah so many layers um and I, and I think that's one of the things that's like you know you can't you can't point to everything that you do because it kind of you you like you know lose the mystique and the mystery of it all. But it's you know there's a lot of moving pieces to bring you that image that comes across your screen. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And two is just how early you start doing it yeah, too. Definitely. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I know a lot of people when they've asked me questions is they don't realize I usually start on a script before there's ever a shoot or way before prep mm -hmm. and stuff like that just to sort of start figuring out problem solving and stuff like that. That's the biggest, they would never even think that. Yeah. 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 I know. Cause I kept thinking like, how are we going to shoot that? 
train arrival. Like, <laughs> like I was trying to wrap my brain around, like, what was it going to look like? What was the tunnel going to look like? Um, I discover so much when I look at the footage. I'm like, oh, my gosh, where did you guys get those rocks? And then Barry's like, no, art department built the rocks. I'm like, oh, OK. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I, you know, I feel like I'm like a kid, the candy store, like looking like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. Where'd you find that? You know? And then asking if I can have some of the props and he's like, (laughs) (laughs) so if that orange dress goes missing, you know, (laughs) so (laughs) next meeting with one of the orange dress on. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Lisa, Caroline, what about you? What are the sort of biggest misconceptions about what you do from people who are, you know, outside? Well, I always, uh, you know, people think that I, um, that decorators make things look pretty, which is not really what we do. But, uh, and also that um, it's so fun because we get to shop all the time. Mm-hmm. And um, both things are not quite true. You know, we, we do uh, a lot of diff- other different things. And, um, but I always thought the most like in on that note is the fact that, you know, most uh, set decorators right now are, are female. It didn't used to be that way. And I think that, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, um, a lot of women that came before us that uh, fought really hard to um, to get a position, a key position. And uh, I think that as soon as that happened and as soon as the, you know, the men stopped being decorators suddenly became this sort of somewhat in you know froofy job where we do things and we make them pretty and it's you know and it's in a way it's sort of like i i just was talking to the producer of the job that i'm on now he invited me to a meeting about set dressing labor and he he was like apologizing because he was taking me away from you know, my creativeness. <laughs> it's mm. like, dude, all I do is like deal with trucking and deal with <laughs> <laughs> you know, the flooring. There's nothing pretty about what I'm doing, you know? So, mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's definitely, and it's within, you know, people don't exactly know what we do even within our business. Like this was a producer talking to me, somebody very experienced who really should know <laughs> how I spent his money, so. <laughs> <laughs> Caroline, what about you? Lisa just said it's, and you're talking to me tonight, like it uh, end of a of a probably 16, 17 hour day, and the like. What I want to tell you is like nobody understands what we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I don't think people realize the details and the in the hard work. I think I think some people think you know, like, oh, you're with actors and you're, you know, it's clothes and all, you know, all this, like, I don't know. I think, do people, I think, I think people do think there's like some glamor to it. I, you know, the, the most, the, the most there, it's not, it's not glamorous. Like if you can, if I turned my, you know, off my computer around and you saw my office right now, <laughs> it's, uh, but I think, you know, the best part of the job is like that where you're creating you know, what I do is creating characters and, you know, in the fitting room and, um, you know, and, and realizing something, but Mm -hmm. it's, it's, and it, but it is, it is a very, uh, it's a very long day. It's not a lot of sleep. It's a lot of, uh, there is no routine you have to adapt to every situation. It's like, it's, and you have, it's constantly changing. And, and those are also the most amazing things about it too. I don't know how we can do, I don't know how I can do anything else. I mean, it's, I, I still think it's so, you know, exciting and amazing that we, what we get to do and, and they feed us, they, we get free food. <laughs> um, but there's, but I think people just think that, you know, what we're just putting clothes on people, but there's so many, uh, you know, it goes, goes such deeper than that from in what Lisa's saying too it's Mm -hmm. it's dirty it's you know the things we do to manipulate things to make them look real and true and right and the amount of you know just layers that Mm -hmm. we we you know do it's um you know it's 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 hard 
amazing, very rewarding work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, Lisa, you mentioning um, the, the meetings about what seed should be planted, you know, and that, that's not something that the average viewer is going to think about, but they do uh, receive the effect of that kind of care, you know, that, that level of detail. But yeah, you know, everything that you'll see on screen, someone has brought it there. Someone has decided on that. There, there are conscious choices behind everything um, that you see on the screen and so much work. Um, I'd like to talk about some of those things and Caroline, I just wanna stay on you for a minute. Can you talk about the shift in costumes um, during Cora and Caesar's journey, you know, so, you know, as they go to South Carolina and, and how that sort of mirrors what's going on in their story? Um, well, I believe the shift you're talking about, the thing that happens is they leave the most desperate, most terrible, mm -hmm. horrific situation. And then they arrive in South Carolina and they are given this new life with these new clothes and things are shiny and new and seem to be very um, civilized and respectful. And then as we know, it is all about control and still being enslaved and still, you know, what they thought was is not. And so I, if that's the way you mean in mirroring what in that journey of what happens, it's, you know, it's all deceit and all, you know, and other mirrors and what's happened through American history, mm -hmm. you know, still till now, you know, with everything that happens in South Carolina is still, you know, sort of happening, is still happening today. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, the, the past is the present is the past is, you know, history repeating, it's still happening, mm -hmm. it's still happening. That's, I think, you know, what we try to do with the costumes. Right, right. Yeah, I remember reading um, an interview, of, or watching rather, an interview of yours in which you talked about the, the prison of the clothes um, and yes. the sort of silhouette of the clothes while they're in South Carolina. And I just found that so fascinating, the way that you were able to use, you know, those shapes and those lines to indicate something larger um, about where Court and Caesar were. Um, Very immediately, the first thing we sort of talked about with South Carolina is that he wanted to treat it like a prison you know, mm -hmm. sort of prison issued clothes and, you know, it looks like finery, you know, and they're mm -hmm. issued these, they've come from this horrific place. And they're given these new clothes, but um, they still have no choices. They're issued this and the things that they do want to buy are marked up to the hilt from the black emporium where they're only allowed to buy separate but equal and, you know, all these things and that aren't true. And um, so, uh, yes, it was still treated very much like like that you know it's all mm -hmm. deceitful and about control and about still you know enslaving a, a population right um daddy i i want to go back to a scene that you were mentioning before a couple scenes rather um the train the, the, yeah. the when the train is coming right and you've talked before about the um i believe the phrase you used was magically real um, Magical realism to it. Yeah, you know, that, that, that Barry wants um, for the show. So can you talk about how you work to really create that kind of like ephemeral infrastructure, you know, upon which these characters uh, can, can take their journey, right? Because the, the point is that it has to look real. But there has to be a quality to it that is, I don't want to say unsettling, but maybe dreamlike or transitory in some way. How are you? How are you navigating that in your work? Yeah, I, it's a very soft, fine line to navigate it. I mean, Joel, Joel, no, because she was on a lot of the calls when we were filing shots. Mm -hmm. But I mean, a lot of it plays into and those shots in episode 101 in Georgia. Um, it took a long time to get that train approach right and to sort of get what you would think are very simple shots of when you're on Cora, that debris that's falling in the train tunnel is we had more enumerations or versions of those than what you would ever imagine. Mm -hmm. But it had to do with a lot, I like what um, Joy was saying before when Colton was writing, is that 
it's all about Cora's journey. You have to stay with her in those moments. And there's something about her POV of sort of feeling this train come in that had a softness to it, that we had to get that right. It had to be dreamy and magical, but yet you were still there. You knew something was coming. Mm -hmm. And then when you turn to her, it's very much her awe of going, wait a minute, there is a train under here and it's very real. And that sort of tells in her expression how she saw it. Mm -hmm. But we also had to do the same thing in the ghost tunnel shots, the sort of when they're falling. And then when Royal takes her down, they're in the same space and it's a very real space. But some of that came in the same way, sort of, and it would, you would never think about it, but it's this very fine particulate is way we deal with the whites on her dress and sort of how we color correct that to sort of set her into that space so that there's nothing that pulls you out of it, but there's things that you just wonder, wait a minute, are we really here? Are we? And I think one of the toughest ones, which became the most real shot is when she's in the training hub and she goes and sees her standing out there and the sort of crowd parts and um, when we first talked about it, in my eyes, it's, it sort of goes back to what I'm saying. When I said, I have to see the way Barry sees it, the way he sees that shot. Because my first vision was it was something magical. It's a space that you know is not there. But, and my thing was, was do we want to alter time? Do we want to sort of shift the way he moves in that space or something? And that's very much not what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And it became one of the most magical moments. But it became something where that background, that train hub that we created was so real. It was beyond real. The lighting matched everything that we shot practically. Mm -hmm. And so by making it that real and that substantial, it made the moment even more heightened of when she goes to see him. And so it's this show, it's very much, and when I hired the vendors, when we talked to vendors and we were looking for vendors to do the show, one of the things I first said to them was, you have to create something to where you're never taken out of the story where no, nobody ever says, wait a minute, that's a visual effects right. shot. Um, it has to support the story at all times mm -hmm. and um, do it in a way to where it's, it's just so subtle and so soft. And it becomes as intricate as when Caroline's talking about the clothes and things like that mm -hmm. is um, all those things play into it. And um, yeah, that's, that's the easiest way to explain it. I don't know. <laughs> no, that's, that's a gorgeous explanation of it. Um, so after the show was wrapped, um, and you're able to watch it, you know, I would love to hear from each of you, what were the things that you saw on screen that you were most proud of having been part of, you know, what, what is the, the one moment, you know, the one look, the one thing that you thought, yes, I, I, that's absolutely perfect. This, this moment, you know, um, I'm so proud of having been part of. There's so many. Yeah. <laughs> no, there are so many. Yeah, I, I will have to say Indiana Winter, um, when they're having the shucking contest and then it goes into that beautiful portrait of the people of Valentine Farm. Mm -hmm. um, and then it goes to Royal and Cora connecting finally. Um, I think that whole sequence is just one that I find so moving and I feel like it's the actual point of the series is, you know, despite the circumstances, this beauty and this hope that exists in these people to survive and to continue in spite of. Um, and that's one of, I think that's probably one of my favorite moments in the series. And um, it Watching it back on the mix stage, I remember um, some of um, some of the crew getting emotional because you know we would we would watch playback, and um, because you know how the episode ends, and you know you feel Cora's journey, and just so that moment of pure joy and being content is you know it's bittersweet. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably my favorite moment. Yeah. Caroline, what about you? You know, it's such a gift to get to work with Barry and he does these portraits, mm -hmm. you know, and you get to see, I really tried to, the story is, and I've said this so many times, but so please forgive me for repeating, but the story is so big and the story is so, you know, incredible and important that the costumes needed to be quiet and, didn't need to take away from, you know, didn't need to be showy and didn't need to, they just needed to be as natural and truthful as, as they can be. And we really, you know, 
that's what I strove for the whole show. Um, and as much as, as far as even staying away from shiny fabrics that were probably period correct, I just mm -hmm. didn't, I didn't want to take away from, but take away from anything or steal any kind of shine or anything. But when you do get to see those portraits and you see all of, you know, that sort of beautiful truth, like, so they're all scattered throughout the, the show. And of course, then there's the, the portrait reel, but mm -hmm. um, you know, that's very, that those portraits are so truthful and that's everything that I ever wanted to do as a designer. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this, like you after, you know, you do some of these panels and you think about, Oh, I wish I would have said this. I wish I would have said that. And I feel like one thing that, um, that maybe I connect with Barry about is that we both love truthful things and want to, you know, depict truth. I think that, you know, that sort of costume design has always been the most, like, it's kind of why I wanted to become a costume designer when I see, when, when a designer, when, when, when there's a costume that really, really hits on something that, you know, how you connect with, you know, like, oh, that's how I saw it, or that just seems so perfect for that or something. Right. I mean, that was, so, you know, those portraits are a gift for, you know, to get to see and get to, get to see those beautiful faces in those costumes and just how they serve the story and serve the people that just, I'm super, I'm very proud and very proud of my whole crew and what, you know, what they, it took a village, you know, to create the underground railroad. Absolutely. And my crew was mm -hmm. incredible. And, you know, they had a huge hand in those portraits too. I just very proud. Mm -hmm. There's, I'm so proud of like Cora is all the way through. I'm proud of like the aging on the clothes and how, you know, we were able to tell the story through what what Cora went through on on the clothes, and mm -hmm. there's a lot to there's a lot I'm very proud of, and very was very lucky to be there, and very grateful to have been a part of it. Yeah, yeah. Lisa, what about you? Well, you know, I was thinking about this a lot because I I I watched um, uh, the show with my son who mm -hmm. was. Uh, uh, almost 16, and uh, this show took me away from my family for a year. You know, I was I was in Atlanta. I'm based in New York. I would see my kids on the weekends, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I knew um, I was very nervous about going away. But it felt like this was the opportunity to help tell a story that was so important, and that I just wanted to be a part of it. My kids are also um, of Haitian descent. They're from Haiti, and um, it just felt like uh, it was telling in a in a you know a, in a larger way a story of their ancestry and um, uh, watching the show uh, with my son and it's not a show you know specifically targeted for teenage boys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I was um, I was nervous because I didn't know how he would react. It's very violent, but it's also there's there's also very abstract and uh, very uh, adult in many ways. And he was so moved and so engaged and just wanted to keep watching. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, it really, he internalized it. And it was, you know, it was in, in a small part his story too. And that was, you know, it was so humbling to see um, that happen. And uh, it made me, you know, it made me proud. And he, at the end, you know, he told me how proud he was of me and of what I did. So that was like the best, you know. Love that. That's so fantastic. So wonderful. <laughs> Daddy, what about you? Ooh, it's a hard question. <laughs> um, I mean, for me, there's a number of points in there, but there's something, and I maybe because we worked on it for so long too, but there's something about when Cora is being led into Tennessee mm. or that shot where she's behind Ridgeway it's sort of just, it's the start of another part of her journey, but it's something that's just so poignant in those moments mm -hmm. when she's in the, in the wagon with Jasper. There's something I haven't talked about a lot very much, but it's something that um, those moments where she's looking at the opening of Joyce when you open 101 and she's at that lakefront, there's, it's those portrait moments of her and things like that. But, um, or poignant, but there's just so many. But I agree with Caroline. There's something about that portraiture that happens. And some of those we did do some work on just a little bit to just still them down even more. But um, it's Cora's eyes. I don't know. There's her facial expressions and the way she yes. carried you through everything, uh, which has very little to do with what I do. 
it's sure, but it's <laughs> you were a part of it. You yeah. could help make that. But, yeah, yeah. It, it makes the story. It really does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so my my final question to all of you again, you know, speaking to this audience of women in film members, hopeful filmmakers, you know, people who just love film, um, and speaking specifically to women who want to, you know, advance in the industry. What is something that you would tell women starting out in these professions, something that you wish you had known? Mm. And I'm just going to start at the top. of the screen. <laughs> Gosh, there's, you go through so many emotions when you're in this, in this business. And I think it's just part of, you know, part of being in it. Um, I feel like I go through all the emotions all the time and think about, oh, you know, I didn't know it was going to, I don't know. It's constantly surprising. But what I would say to, and, and that can be a, a wonderful thing. Gosh, it's such a place of growth and don't be scared of that growth. Mm. I mean, it really is like, I look to where I was years ago and then now I see where I am now and just the way that I sort of maybe deal with a certain situation or um, you know, just the experience, you know, I, I think it gets better and better as you, as you go along and gets better year after year, if you keep working and working hard and don't, don't be scared, go for it, follow your yeah. dreams. I mean, I did, I just like this, I wanted to do this so badly. And I don't know that will, that will, that will, will carry you to places. It, it really, that, want and and you know and don't be to put yourself out there meet as many people as you can and just uh, people find me on instagram all the time it's amazing and i try to talk to everybody you know um just keep be persistent and talk to everybody you can and don't be and you're going to be scared as hell but do it it's going to be amazing yeah it's all worth it. It's all wonderful. And you're going to do stuff you never thought you'd do. And you don't even know how to do all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> but you get better at those challenges later on. So that's a little comforting of like, oh, sure. We're going to do this now. Oh yeah, I can do it. <laughs> Any other advice you want to share things you wish you would know? I, I think. I think I kind of knew it, but it's really important to not only to establish relationships, but really cultivate mm -hmm. and make sure that you stay in touch with people that aesthetically you connect with. Because, mm -hmm. you know, case in point, Annalie Blank, who's our sound supervisor and re-recording mixer, she mixed a short that I cut for Barry called Chlorophyll. Mm. And she was like, I want to work with you guys. Like she was very adamant about it. And she was just getting her feet wet. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, there's not a lot of, you know, female mixers or sound supervisors. Like, mm -hmm. and she was doing it and she always wanted to get into film. And right at the point, at that point, she was just mixing television, but she stayed in touch and she kept in contact. And when we could afford her on Beale street, you know, she mixed our movie and now she's done every project. She actually came out and helped us on moonlight. She did three days to help our mix. And so I think she's a prime example of like knowing who you want to work with and not forgetting that yeah. because you know it pays off in the long run. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Any more advice, things you wish you had known? Um, I don't know if I wish I'd known, but it's just something I keep reminding myself a lot of is you should want everything to be difficult. Yeah. Because when it's difficult, you can do anything. You know how to handle it when it seems impossible. Uh, and so I think a lot of that comes, especially in my side of the business, there's not a ton of visual effects supervisors that are women. And so it's, um, it's something that if you learn to listen and to sort of pay attention and to think and sort of you can and sort of like Caroline says, I may not know how to do it most of the time. You should figure it out. It's not that hard to figure it out. But mm -hmm. yeah, so as long as you lay the groundwork for it, you can do it. Lisa, words of advice? Well, I, I would say, um, you know, don't forget um, who opened the doors for you before mm -hmm. you were there. Um, you know, we, we are still, you know, we're, we're still, uh, 
a, a predominantly white male uh, industry. Um, don't forget that, you know, uh, women before us came and opened these doors for us to be here and make sure that, you know, that you remember that as you um, hire and mentor people that come after you and, and uh, keep that in mind, hire as many women and people of color as you can, uh, mentor them, teach them. Um, that's, you know, I think a really, really important part. Like, I, I always think that people, we, we, even within the industry, we forget how, um, you know, even though we don't have to put suits on and, uh, you know, it's a very sort of relaxed environment, there's still, there's still a lot of discrimination that goes on. And uh, we just have to be very, very aware of that and pay attention and, and don't forget, you know, let's not never forget our own voices and, uh, you know, speak up for ourselves and, you know, be strong, be brave and all of that. I love it. That's that's a perfect <laughs> ending. The panel. That's so good. Thank you all so much for being here and sharing your genius. This show was I I'm, I'm left speechless by it. You know, I couldn't believe what I was watching that human hands had put this together. This absolutely luminous series and you were all to be congratulated for the part you played in bringing this gift. Um, to screens. If you're watching this panel and you have not yet watched the Underground Railroad, please, please take the time to do so. You, uh, your, your worldview is going to change. You know, what they are doing with this show has never been done before and it is absolutely exquisite. Um, I want to thank all of my panelists again for joining me. Caroline Esselin, Joy McMillan, Lisa Scopa, Dottie Starling. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and take care. We hope to speak to you all again soon. Thank, Thank you so, so much. Bye. 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 Bye.